Item number, SCP-009. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. Object is to be contained within a sealed storage tank of heat-resistant alloy, with dimensions not less than 2 meters by 2 meters by 2 meters. Under no circumstances should SCP-009 be exposed to temperatures in excess of 0 degrees Celsius when not undergoing testing, and no water-based solutions shall be allowed within 30 meters of the object's containment area. Object's chamber is to be fitted with temperature sensors, which must be monitored at all times, and is to be kept refrigerated by no fewer than three redundant cooling units. Any malfunction of sensors or of coolant systems is to be reported and repaired immediately. If at any time the temperature in the containment area climbs above negative 5 degrees Celsius, the chamber is to be locked down and flooded with coolant until temperatures return to safe levels, negative 30 degrees Celsius to negative 25 degrees Celsius. Containment area is to be kept in total vacuum during testing, and personnel interacting with SCP-009 must wear full environmental protection gear. Following testing, all equipment, personnel, and other materials must undergo dehydration procedures and be quarantined for no less than 12 hours. Any moisture found displaying properties of SCP-009 is to be quarantined and added to the containment area as soon as possible. Living organisms found to be contaminated by SCP-009 are to be terminated by chemical desiccation and extracted molecules of SCP-009 added to containment. Description SCP-009 is approximately liters of a substance which superficially resembles distilled water, H2O, except with a distinct bright red hue. This red hue is discernible in all phases and serves as the most expedient method of identifying contaminated matter before its anomalous properties manifest. In contrast to mundane water, SCP-009 assumes a liquid phase at temperatures between negative 100 degrees Celsius and 0 degrees Celsius, and a solid state above those temperatures. At temperatures below negative 100 degrees Celsius, SCP-009 vaporizes into a gaseous phase similar to steam. Examinations of the atomic structure of SCP-009 have proved inconclusive. The substance appears to be identical to normal water molecules, with the exception of in contrast to standard laws of enthalpy. Dr. Cite a resident expert on xenospatial physics, suggests that SCP-009 may originate in a universe with alternate physical laws. The most hazardous property of SCP-009, however, is its ability to contaminate normal H2O. When in contact with any aqueous solution, SCP-009 will, through unknown mechanisms, transfer its anomalous properties to other objects and creatures. Testing has shown it capable of assimilating ice, steam, tea, fruit juice, seawater, blood, and data expunged. The time it takes for this process to occur varies depending on temperature and the exact chemical composition of affected matter, and had been observed as taking between 3 minutes and hours. Experiments on D-Class personnel have illustrated the process of conversion by the substance, which has been found to follow a consistent pattern. 1. Initial Exposure Subject is exposed to SCP-009, and it begins assimilating any moisture present on the exposed surface. Creatures in this stage do not commonly notice any unusual symptoms except for a slight warming sensation. 2. Surface Conversion Frost begins to form on the exposed area as the heat produced by the subject and SCP-009 itself raises its temperature above 0 degrees Celsius. This stage can take anywhere from 1 minute to hours, during which time subjects begin to feel crystals from the epidermis. 3. Deep Tissue Conversion Exponential increase in temperature of SCP-009 causes runaway reaction throughout subject's body resulting in actual blood loss is minimal due to ice crystals allowing subjects to remain alive and conscious for up to hours. 4. Data Expunged Testing on D-Class personnel was discontinued as of 4-23-2000 Addendum Circumstances of Retrieval Subject was found in Alaska on November 5th, 19 the Foundation became involved after reports were obtained from the native tribe 
who came across the mangled bodies of a team of seal hunters, which had apparently been shipwrecked kilometers from the village. All victims were found encased in red ice. Cause of death recorded is internal bleeding, though closer examination found it is surmised that the low ambient temperatures in the area retarded the freezing process. This prolonged the time to total conversion by hours and allowed the victims to remain conscious until data expunged. Origin of SCP-009 is currently unknown. Investigation into similar events or materials in the area is ongoing. Evidence at the scene suggests possibly involving SCP- See Exploration Log A009-1 for details. Exploration Log November 5th, 19... Situation Report Mobile Task Force Beta-7, the Has Matters, was deployed to recovery site to catalog and safely retrieve samples of SCP-009 for transport to site... Agent... Bryce, MTFB-7, made a visual inspection of the area and noted three bodies, all male, between the ages of and 40 years. Dr. also on site, surmised from the relative position of subjects that Mr. age 32, hereafter referred to as Subject Zero, was the origin point of Subsequent subjects are presumed to have been exposed to SCP-009 while attempting to help Subject Zero back to the wreckage of the boat. During standard perimeter sweep, Agent Hughes located what appeared to be humanoid tracks leading northeast. After brief deliberation, a three-man team consisting of Agents Hughes, Whitmore, and Cassidy was dispatched to investigate potential security breach. Begin Log 642-43 EST Agent Hughes, we found something, Control. It's a cave. The tracks lead inside. Control. Copy, Hughes. What do you see? Hughes. Looks like a crack in the ice. It's maybe a meter tall. The opening's not very wide. Agent Whitmore. Captain, we got a body. Unidentified shuffling noises are heard. Control. We didn't copy, Hughes. Repeat. Hughes. There's a subject here, Control. Frozen in the skip. Male. About 15. Looks like he was trying to crawl away from something. There's a spear gun here. Also frozen. It's been fired. Control. Any signs of trauma? Agent Cassidy. Without touching him, I can't be sure. But it looks like he was stabbed by something. See how he's gripping his chest here? Right where this spike is growing out. He might have been attacked. Hughes. Did you hear her, Control? Control. Affirmative. Tag the coordinates for recovery and proceed into the cave. Whitmore. We using live fire, Captain? Hughes, there might be hostiles, so yes, but keep them in single shot mode, don't want the guns getting too hot. Cassidy, good call, don't want to end up like this guy. Whitmore, unintelligible, that's for sure. Agents ready their weapons and proceed, approximately two minutes pass. Whitmore, unintelligible. Control, please repeat Hughes, we didn't copy. Hughes, it's, there's a chamber in here, Control. I'd say five or six meters in diameter. It's filled with red ice. In the middle, there's a pool. Looks about three meters wide. Depth unknown. Cassidy, the f cat. Screams are heard. Gunfire. Control. Hughes, come in. Are there hostiles? There is a brief pause. Hughes. F hell. Negative control, just. Jesus, a f polar bear. It's dead. There's dozens of bodies here. Not human. I see a few seals, a snow fox, and a... What the hell? Whitmore. The f*** is that? Cassidy. No, 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 no. Oh, God. Control. Hughes, do you copy? Hughes. Cassidy found a... Um... A spider. A giant spider. There is a pause, during which shuffling and hard breathing are heard. Control. Is it alive? What do you mean by giant? Hughes. I mean f***ing huge control. At least a meter leg span. It's frozen. Wait, no. Sh I don't see anything inside. It almost looks like it's made of this stuff. Cassidy. Unintelligible. Not possible. 
We're nowhere close to Germany. Whitmore. What? What about Germany? Cassidy. Captain. I'm pretty sure that's 3023. Control. Repeat, Captain. Hughes. Cassidy said the spider is SCP-3023, Control. There is a pause. Control. That's not possible, Hughes. Why would she think that? Cassidy, voice elevated. I'm sure, Control. I've worked with 3023. It's an instant made of Skip 9. Whitmore. Wait, what's 3023? Control. That is classified. Agent Cassidy, you are to speak no more of this. If the specimen is destroyed, there is no reason to worry about it. Please continue your search. Cassidy, mumbling. But how the f did it get here? Hughes. We copy control. Cassidy, sweep the perimeter. See if there's any side tunnels. Cassidy, but Hughes. That's an order. Cassidy, unintelligible. Hughes. Check these corpses. See if there's any humans. Whitmore, on it. Control. Agent Hughes, how deep is the pool you mentioned? Hughes, can't see the bottom. God, I'm having SCP-354 flashbacks. This is not cool. Control. Focus, Captain. Is there anything nearby you can use to measure the depth? Hughes pauses. Well, the spider has a spear sticking out of it. Control. Can you safely retrieve it? Hughes. The suit should protect me, right? Control. All the same, try not to touch the affected material. Hughes. All right. I've got it. Should work. Looks to be about 1.5 meters long. Control. Copy that, Hughes. Proceed with caution. There is a pause. Hughes. Well, it's definitely more than a meter deep. I could go further, but I'd have to get my hand closer to that stuff. Suit or no suit, I'd prefer not to do that. Control. Affirmative, Captain. We'll dispatch some D-Class with gear to test that out. Continue your search. Hughes. Copy that. Well, I guess I'm... Cassidy. Voice distant. Captain. Hughes. Stand by, Control. What is it, Cassidy? Cassidy. Voice distant. I think you're going to want to see this, sir. I think I know where the spider came from. Hughes. Control, I'm going deeper in the cave. Control. Affirmative. Proceed. Approximately one minute of boots crunching on ice and packed snow. Hughes. Oh, that's not good. Control. What do you see, Captain? Hughes. Uh, an aperture. About a meter in diameter. It's covered in the stuff. Cassidy! Ten seconds of silence. Hughes. Report! Control. Do you have a visual of Agent Cassidy? Hughes. No. Sh she must have gone inside. Control. Please remain calm. Describe this aperture. Hughes. I, uh... It just looks like a tunnel, but there's no ice past the mouth. Red or otherwise. I can make out a dim light coming from somewhere inside. Might be Cassidy's torch. Control. Is there anything else unusual? Hughes. Cassidy. Cassidy. Control. Captain Hughes, please respond. Is there anything else unusual about the tunnel? Hughes. Yeah, it's... It's wet. The walls are. And the floor. There's a puddle about a meter down. Sh it's... The puddle is red. A few minutes of breathing and shuffling noises. Hughes. Control, did you get that? Control. Affirmative. Stand by. 30 seconds of breathing, followed by approaching footsteps. Whitmore. Yo, what's up? Where's Cassidy? Hughes. She went in there. Whitmore. Yo, Cassidy. Holla back, girl. 30 seconds of silence. Hughes. Unintelligible. Control, I'm going in there. Control. Negative, Hughes. We're rerouting a team of D-Class for recovery. Your orders are to withdraw the rest of your team and await further orders. Hughes. Whitmore. Whoa, hold up. Take it easy. Control. You have your orders, Hughes. I don't think I need to remind you. Data expunged. 45 seconds of silence. Hughes. Copy control. Let's go. End log. Addendum. November 9th, 19... After initial report and retrieval of specimens, 
It was confirmed that the arachnoid entity found by MTFB-7 was indeed a previously unknown instance of SCP-3023. Investigation has revealed the instance originated in as a result of data expunged. Addendum, December 6, 19... After repeated inquiries, it should be noted that the portion of coastline upon which the initial victims were found was barren rock, approximately meters from the seashore, and was sufficiently dry and cold to prevent significant contamination of the surrounding area. Had the site been closer to the water, there is little doubt an extinction-level event would have ensued. Consideration of upgrading SCP-009 to Keter class under review. Addendum, December 16th, 2000. Supercooling of SCP-009 for the purposes of experimentation is disallowed until further notice. Personnel are advised that liquid nitrogen is only to be used on the subject in controlled amounts, and only until temperatures have reached acceptable levels. Related note. Possible application of SCP-009 in cold fusion research pending evaluation. Memo from O5 Command, January 9th, 2000. We've decided to keep this thing Euclid for now. We understand the concerns raised, but as long as you keep the power on and nobody goes near its containment area, there shouldn't be a problem. That's why we're keeping it in sight after all. As for the cold fusion research, we're putting a pin in that for now. Frankly, we don't have it in the budget for another snafu like Site. The salvage team still hasn't found Dr. Cross-testing report 9507F23. The following experiment record was recovered via a chance occurrence of SCP-507 shifting into a universe in which the described test was carried out using SCP-107. The applicability of the reported findings to our own universe is pending review. Input, 10 milliliters of SCP-009. Result, red snow fell in test area for 27 minutes with moderate intensity. Grass growing in test area began runaway reaction, which ended with entire area being frozen within minutes. Notably, anti-enthalpathic reaction of SCP-009 did not extend past the effective radius of SCP-107 for reasons still under investigation. Non-grass plants in area turned bright red in color, greatly expanded, and mutated to display cyan-colored tentacles similar to those of species Drosera capensis. Mucilage produced by these tentacles later found to be tiny beads of SCP-009. How the plant is able to survive with SCP-009 integrated into its cell structure is currently under investigation with preliminary hypothesis being the plant is a reflection of flora from the substance's native universe. Item number, SCP-328. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-328 is to be kept in a secure locker in storage area 328A. Access for research requires level three authorization and will be permitted in most instances. Due to its unclear nature, SCP-328 is not to be allowed into contact with any data reading device, with a connection to the internet, or the foundation intranet. Electronic devices which have been used to study SCP-328 should be clearly labeled SCP-328 use only, and stored in storage area 328A for common use, in case of unidentified viral properties. A small isolated lab adjunct to storage area 328A Designated 328B has been established to this end. Description SCP-328 is a smooth greenish-yellow disc, approximately 10 centimeters in diameter and 4 millimeters thick, weighing just over 13 grams, composed of an unknown crystalline organic compound. The bonding pattern of SCP-328 is highly organized, in a manner reminiscent of a data storage or retrieval device. SCP-3281, a data file retrieved from SCP-328, seems to confirm this. Various analyses of samples of SCP-328 have been inconclusive. Some known atomic elements have been identified, but none in recognized compositional patterns, and not enough to account for the mass of the samples used. It is slightly warmer, about 4 degrees Celsius, than its surrounding environment, 
even when subjected to extreme temperatures. It is susceptible to kinetic damage, but if broken, reforms itself from its largest remaining piece over a period of one week to six months, depending on the severity of damage. Crystallographic analysis of fragments indicates they possess a restructured crystalline form, a scaled-down version of the whole item's structure. As the disk regrows, the structure re-expands and returns to its original form. No changes have been observed in binary data obtained from the disk reader before and after breakage or reformation. SCP-328 has been in the possession of the Foundation since 18 when it was recovered from data expunged. For some time, the purpose and nature of SCP-328 was uncertain. In an accidental breakthrough, SCP-328 was inserted into an experimental disk drive that had been treated with as part of the project. SCP-328, when used with this reader, produces binary data. Multiple cryptographic analyses of the binary code produced indicate that at least some of it is a description of data contained on SCP-328. An algorithm for converting the binary into ASCII code has been developed, and the current extent of translation is appended as SCP-3281. Veracity of this data is uncertain, but given the coherence of the data produced, it seems unlikely it is a random fluke. Curiously, the data obtained is written in over 30 known languages, transliterated into Roman characters, in what appears to be a single article. Further attempts to directly access and translate the data on SCP-328 have proven labor-intensive, and full funding for the project has been pulled. Dr. E has announced that anyone with relevant skills, cryptography, data storage and recovery, or linguistics in particular, is welcome to take up translation of SCP-328 as a hobby item. Addendum 3281 As Project which produced the original SCP-328 data reader, has been cancelled for over a decade. Dr. E has lodged a formal request for O5 clearance to remove the redaction, allowing anyone working on SCP-328 to consider this information. Permission is pending. SCP-3281 This comprises the main body of the documents translated from SCP-328. Much of the actual log consists of random ASCII characters, which may be untranslatable text, untranslated text, or may correspond to some other type of information. All data has been translated into English for ease of comprehension. The original untranslated log with complete additional text is stored at SCP-3281-OR disk in Storage Area 328-A. Translated data begins. It is approximately 4 units in width, 6 units in length, and 0.4 units high when sitting on a flat surface. Its external surface is essentially featureless, aside from unrecognized markings on several surfaces and several narrow slots along the two shorter edges. It tastes of sodium chloride, present in trace, non-toxic quantities on its surface, and of carbon-based oils and polymers of unidentified composition. Untranslatable or graphic analysis of the residues present on the surface and of the material of which the device is comprised, indicate it contains several elements unknown to our science. When inactive, it radiates very little energy. Its surrounding untranslatable is flavorless, aside from a hint of untranslatable. Three indentations along the edge release electromagnetic radiation in a rhythmic pulse. Upon depression of a smooth, flavorless, i.e. possessing only the same base flavor as the object, surface on the same edge as the radiators, the top half of the device comes loose, revealing itself to be hinged along the opposite surface. Inside is what appears to be a control console, with 104 nearly identical depressible surfaces, most of a uniform size. Researcher F has described them as sequence of untranslatable data. For each of the untranslatable, inside its outer untranslatable, but underneath, it is an untranslatable sequence of untranslated data. When a small oblong surface is pressed, the translucent surface above the primary interface almost immediately begins emitting class untranslatable radiation, which claim the untranslatable of four researchers before adequate shielding could be devised. 
Operation. Trial and error has revealed that depressing certain combinations of the surfaces on the control console will cause changes in the spectrum of radiation emitted by the device. Although the nature of these changes has yet to be determined, the patterns are consistent. Additionally, the device does not emit identical radiation from every surface. It appears to have over one million nearly identical micro-emitters, arranged in a grid-like pattern across its surface. Each one is capable of emitting variable radiation frequencies. When cataloged and mapped, the different frequencies of radiation form patterns and symbols, which at least partially correspond to the symbols mapped onto the control console. Long Sequence of Untranslated Data Power Source was identified by Researcher F. By activating two sliding panels previously unnoticed on the underside of the control console, a roughly cylindrical portion hidden beneath the hinge could be removed. While externally undifferentiable from the main portion of the device, this segment is somewhat denser. After its removal, the device would not activate. It has been advised that the device should be stored in this format from this point on. Against Researcher F's advice, Sub-Researcher S, out of curiosity, manipulated what is believed to be a connection socket on the putative power supply. A untranslatable was observed to emit, involuntarily, from Sub-Researcher S, followed by data expunged. Although this is a feasible, if unsavory, method for recharging the device, should its power supply fail, it is recommended that valuable sub-researchers not be used in this manner in the future. Addendum 1.01 .01. Researcher F has been committed to safety storage device copyright PDHEX for reconditioning after activating a memetic weapon on the device. Simultaneous depression of the two control surfaces labeled untranslatable and untranslatable activated a heretofore unidentified capacity on the device. Untranslatable type electromagnetic radiation was emitted in a frequency fluctuating pattern of moderate to long wavelength. This interfered directly with researcher F, as has previously been documented in logs of device untranslatable. Researcher F was recorded as spewing gibberish about seeking a connection and something about a web. Further exposure to the device is ill-advised at this time. Observation from Queen Researcher It seems certain that this is another memetoenergetic weapon developed by Agency Untranslatable. In light of this, the Research Council should consider releasing another untranslatable through the No Further Translated Information. Item Number SCP-409 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures No physical contact may be made with SCP-409 for any reason. Anything making physical contact with SCP-409 must be contained in quarantine immediately, along with any materials used in the transport of the subject. SCP-409 must be kept in a granite case at all times. Any transportation of SCP-409 must be done in a sealed granite container. Residue from SCP-409's effect are to be sealed in granite containers along with any tools used to transport residue into containers. Description SCP-409 resembles a large quartz crystal, approximately 1.5 meters or 5 feet tall, and 0.6 meters or 2 feet wide. Any objects coming in contact with SCP-409 will begin to crystallize after three hours. This effect will occur in any material other than granite. The crystallization will spread by approximately 2.5 centimeters or 1 inch per minute and will convert the entire object or organism inside and out. Subjects report this effect to be extremely painful and similar to frostbite. After complete crystallization, the object will begin to make snapping and creaking noises for approximately 20 minutes before bursting into thousands of fragments with great force. Anything touched by or touching a fragment will immediately begin to crystallize. Nothing at this time is able to reverse the effect in organic matter, including amputation of affected areas. Inorganic matter will only crystallize for a few centimeters around point of contact. SCP-409 was recovered and expunged under a pile of crystal shards several feet deep. Losses of personnel during recovery were high. Addendum 4091 
with the suggestion of Dr. 500-0021-D. Subject 409-D5 was exposed to the effects of SCP-409 and was left to become severely crystallized. After that, he was treated with SCP-500 and a complete recovery was achieved in nine days. Subject reported that he continued to feel pain in body parts that were crystallized, even after the estimated recovery time. Pain faded 13 days after subject was treated. It is unknown if the pain effect was psychological or real during the intervening four days. Addendum 4092 Extensive testing has yielded no information as to why the crystallization occurs. SCP-409 and the shards created by it are indistinguishable from any other quartz crystal. The effect appears to be similar to a seed crystal, where a pre-existing crystal formation is added to a solution, causing the crystal to… grow. SCP-409, however, appears to do this with all solid matter and does not need to remain in contact. How this is done, why SCP-409 is unique among all other quartz crystals, and why granite is the only material immune, are all still unknown. Item Number SCP-553 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures The primary colony of SCP-553 is to be kept in the cave system they were discovered in, located in China. Coordination with the Chinese Ministry of State Security has resulted in the surrounding area being declared a munitions testing range and off-limits to non-military personnel. Foundation agents have further encouraged local folklore, which indicates that the cave system is inhabited by demons, in order to discourage casual exploration. A Chinese Foundation security force is stationed on site and will monitor the status of the colony. 125 instances of SCP-553 have been transported to Site-37 for observation and experimentation. They are kept in an 8 meter by 17 meter by 5 meter steel-walled room, whose interior replicates conditions in their originating cave system. Native cave flora and fauna are to be maintained in sufficient quantities to provide the appropriate nutritional needs of SCP-553. Multiple IR and night vision cameras have been installed in order to provide full coverage of the interior, as well as numerous passive acoustic sensors. Any personnel entering the chamber must only use the designated path and be wearing full body protection, as laid out in Document 5330942 Alpha. Effective 0601 2000. A decontamination airlock has been installed and all rooms and hallways adjoining SCP-553's chamber are to be equipped with high-strength UV lamps, as well as a humidity level of 50% or less. Industrial dehumidifiers are to be on hand in the case of containment breach. Description SCP-553 is a colony of approximately 140,000 winged organisms, superficially resembling butterflies. They possess a silicone-based biochemistry and are composed primarily of calcium and silicate compounds. The body of a member of the species is mostly calcite, with some of the internal organs composed of a material similar to quartz with piezoelectric properties. This silicate impurity adds rigidity to the creature, giving it a rating from 3.5 to 4.5 on the Mohs hardness scale. Although they continue to grow throughout their observed lifespan, the growth rate slows considerably once they have entered their adult stage. The average observed wingspan of an adult is 2.3 centimeters. The life cycle is notable in that it appears more closely related to crystal growth than standard biological growth. The creature starts out as a crystal seed rather than an egg. Adult instances deposit them on stalactites and they hatch approximately 12 days later. The larval stage appears as anthodites and leach minerals from the stalactite using a weak acid. They move extremely slowly, approximately 5 centimeters per day, and leave distinctive tracks behind them as they progress. These tracks can be used to discriminate between genuine anthodites and SCP-553. The larval stage lasts approximately 70 days, at which point it becomes stationary and begins to grow its wings. 
During the transition from the larval to the adult stage, the wings of an instance of SCP-553 grow rapidly, becoming fully formed in less than nine hours, at which point the adult will detach from the stalactite. Through an unknown process, SCP-553 maintains a relatively stable population, with eggs only being laid when an adult dies. The population transplanted to containment has stabilized at 137, give or take two. Members of SCP-553 primarily rely on a form of echolocation to sense their surroundings. They do this by creating a variety of ultra-high-pitched tones via scraping and striking their legs together and appear to use their wings as a mobile array to detect reflected sound. Additionally, they appear to have a variety of chemosensors in their foot pads, allowing them to determine the mineral composition of the surfaces they land on. Adult instances of SCP-553 primarily feed by scraping fungus and lichen from the cavern floor and, to a lesser extent, leaching minerals from stalagmites, using a similar acid as used by the larval stage. Note, adults have never been observed to feed from stalactites. It is hypothesized that this is an adaptation to preserve food stock for the larval stage. When any adult instance of SCP-553 suffers significant damage, it produces a unique sonar signature, which alerts all other nearby adults to the presence of danger. Adults will swarm the perceived source of danger and proceed to attack it by attempting to slice it with their wings. The wings of SCP-553 members have an average thickness of 5 millimeters, where they attach to the body and taper rapidly to an average thickness of 0.05 millimeters with sharp, beveled edges. In testing, individual lacerations as deep as 1 centimeter have been measured. However, deeper lacerations usually result in some portion of the wing structure breaking off in the inflicted wound. These fragments typically continue to fracture in the wound due to mechanical stresses. The circulatory fluid of SCP-553 reacts with most carbon-based tissues in a necrotizing fashion, resulting in significant post-traumatic infections. Incident 553-4 Gamma On 05-21-2000, 21 instances of SCP-553 escaped their containment chamber due to an improperly sealed access door. They reacted to recapture attempts as an attack and retaliated. SCP-553 displayed a high degree of pattern recognition and target analysis and quickly focused their attacks on the exposed fleshy parts of the containment personnel, particularly the throat and face. The nine immediate fatalities received, on average, 10 wounds greater than one centimeter. It is currently hypothesized that these were caused by multiple slashes on the same wound site. The secondary necrotic infections caused by SCP-553 wounds resulted in a further eight deaths. Twelve instances were successfully recaptured and returned to containment, and the remaining dead instances were retained for autopsy, structural analysis, and chemical analysis of their circulatory fluid. Item Number SCP-578 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-578 is to be contained within standard safe class anomalous liquids tanks. Any personnel, excluding D-Class under testing conditions, are to wear level C hazmat suits while handling SCP-578. All newly recorded instances of SCP-578-1 are to be catalogued and destroyed. Description: SCP-578 is a colorless, odorless liquid consisting of a solution of water, silicone, and a previously unknown and uncharacterized enzyme. It has a viscosity of 0.9 CP at 29 degrees Celsius, a boiling point of 123 degrees Celsius at sea level, and a freezing point of 4 degrees Celsius. At the time of this writing, 413 liters of SCP-578 exist in containment. SCP-578's anomalous properties manifest when it is brought into contact with human blood. First, SCP-578 spreads throughout the blood, 
by way of rapid diffusion. The enzyme in SCP-578 then causes a clotting cascade in the blood, followed by crystallization of the blood via chemical reaction. This crystallized blood is designated an instance of SCP-578-1. Approximately 1.7 milliliters of SCP-578 is required to fully convert a liter of blood. SCP-578-1's chemical structure is reminiscent of opals, consisting of hydrated silica. During the crystallization process, clots of blood cells become trapped within the structure of SCP-578-1, resulting in a bright red coloration. Tests involving SCP-578 and blood plasma have confirmed that the absence of these blood clots in the structure of SCP-578-1 results in a significantly weaker structure. SCP-578-1 has a hardness of 6.8 on the Mohs scale and a melting point of 1,020 degrees Celsius. SCP-578-1 is not capable of converting more blood and can be handled without protective gear. SCP-578 and several hundred instances of SCP-578-1 were initially discovered during a Foundation raid on a Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD facility. The facility had been used as a production site for various items made of SCP-578-1. The exact process MC&D used to create SCP-578 is unknown. Addendum 1 Excerpt from Recovered Document HKG-35 Here at Marshall, Carter, and Dark, we cater to only the most exclusive clientele, people of discriminating taste. We understand that those of your caliber demand only the finest, the pinnacle of quality in jewelry. That is why MC&D is proud to present the most incredible gems of all time. Blood Opals Created from the very sap of men's veins. Crafted by artisans into wondrous settings in a true marriage of art and jewelry. These one-of-a-kind pieces easily outclass any you have seen before. In ancient Greek mythology, the ichor of the gods' veins could grant to mortals agelessness or even immortality. Blood opals capture a similar effect, producing an aura of rejuvenation and regeneration. They add vigor to your limbs, taste to your food, and color to your cheeks. This holiday season, show that special someone you care. After all, what says I love you like a piece of life, a piece of you? Addendum 2 SCP-578-0676 Item Number 0676 Recovery Date Expunged. Item Description A statue of a human cardiovascular system composed of SCP-578-1. The item is 2.1 meters in height, including a 0.3 meter tall base composed of granite. Analysis of the item has discovered few tool marks, with the exception of those around the metal supports attaching the statue to the granite base. It is theorized that the item must have been created by injecting SCP-578 into a living human, as the pooling of blood in a dead body would result in a partial statue. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.